Well, I, I thank the uh, Parkinson Society of British Columbia for inviting me and you all for inviting me. It's my fourth visit to this beautiful area of the world, British Columbia. I've been to Victoria twice now. I've been to Whistler. I've been to Vancouver twice. And what a, what a great place to live, and you're all very lucky. And uh, I should also say you're all very lucky to have the Parkinson si Society of British Columbia doing all their good deeds. I've listened you know, to Gene, and I've been here before, and I've seen what, what uh, Colin has told you about the organization. And I thought, this is pretty much the way I would organize this if I were the, the czar of Parkinson in, the, in this province. I'm not, and you can be thankful of that. But I think they've done a fabulous job at uh, all the good works that they do. So you probably, many of you know a lot uh, of what I'm going to tell you now in the next couple of minutes, but uh, probably some of you don't. So let's start out with some basic information. In Parkinson's disease, recognized decades and decades ago was people that have Parkinson's disease when they die of whatever they die from, and you look at their midbrain, they don't have a substantia nigra like the rest of us do. So that was a, an important discovery. And moving on from what was discovered subsequently, and this was back in the 1960s, Arvid Carlson won a Nobel Prize for his work with dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. The kinds of things you saw under the microscope in high school biology with a nucleus and cytoplasm, but neurons are different. They have a long wire-like process that is a wire conceptually as well, too. So the brain has 100 billion cells, and they're all wired together. And the, this wiring is a dynamic process. It's changing all the time. Every time you, you learn something, like I can remember the hotel number of my room where I'm going back later today. And how did I do that? This the dynamism of the human brain. You're always remodeling that depending upon your, your present experiences and modifying past experiences. So the human brain, 100 billion neurons, basically are these incredible wiring diagrams schematically, and that's possible because it's not just the cell body, but it's this long wire-like process, and that's the wire. Now, the conduction in that long wire-like process is electrical, but at the very end of that long wire-like process are little bulbs, little outpouchings, and so it's like the, the, uh, a tree branch with a lot of little spokes coming out, and that connects up with a lot of other cells. In fact, one neuron may have connections to a few thousand other cells. This is an incredible thing. You know, the scientists aren't going to replicate the human brain anytime soon. It's just so incredibly complicated. But at the end of that long wire-like process, where you have these different uh, fascicles that are going out and connecting up with other neurons, at the end of those are little bulbs and they release chemicals. And that's how you communicate from one neuron to the next. So the chemical that's released is called a neurotransmitter. That chemical in the substantia nigra is dopamine. That's what Arvid Carlson won the Nobel Prize for from his work in the 1960s. And it was uh, bordering on that, that it was recognized that people with Parkinson's disease have very low brain dopamine levels. Is that always true? Yes, that's always true. And that led to the discovery that you can replenish brain dopamine and you can reverse a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So I'm going to walk over to this slide and, and point so that everybody is clear. So here's the substantia nigra on the two sides. They're, the brain has two halves, so things on the right are typically mirrored by things on the left. This is the spinal cord that goes downstream. Top of the head is up there. That's right and that's left. The substantia nigra has a long wire-like process that connects up with the striatum, and that's where the arrow was pointing. The striatum is actually two nuclei, the caudate and the putamen, but together they're called the striatum. So this system is often called the nigrostriatal system. Is this important? Well, it's important if you go online and read about it because you're going to encounter these terms, dopamine, substantia nigra, nigrostriatal, and so on. So it's helpful to have some background. You know, we all learn things based upon uh, the, uh, some basic understanding of the, of the concepts, and so these are good things to hang your hats on when you're trying to understand what you're reading online about Parkinson's disease. 
So to recap, the nigrostriatal system uses a neurotransmitter. It is dopamine. Dopamine is low in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease, and that low brain dopamine seems to be the substrate for many of the Parkinson's disease symptoms. So what's going on in these brain neurons that are degenerating? Well, what was recognized in 1912, Frederick Louis was looking at brains of people with Parkinson's disease under the microscope, and he recognized these proteinaceous inclusions within the cells, not throughout the whole brain, but in certain areas of the brain, and he wrote a scientific paper on the subject, inclusions within brain cells, and about seven years later, there was a Russian scientist, Tretiakov, who replicated that and recognized that Frederick Louis had seen those first, and hence they became Louis bodies. Is that important? Well, Louis bodies are the hallmark of Parkinson's disease. That was the beginning of that nomenclature, but that's something that now has persisted up to the present time as the recognized marker of Parkinson's disease. So if you have Parkinsonism, that is a descriptive term, that means you look like you have Parkinson's disease, but if a doctor diagnoses you with Parkinson's disease, the implication should be that you have Lewy bodies in your brain. Now we don't do brain autopsies on living people, so this is inferred, but this is actually part of this whole unified understanding of what Parkinson's disease is all about. And so these Lewy bodies are these proteinaceous inclusions within brain cells that don't belong there. There was uh, a, a study that was done several years ago in Seattle. John Leverance and colleagues uh, with mass spectroscopy broke down the constituents of Lewy bodies. Turns out there are about 200, not, not about, there were 296 things that were identified in that mass spectroscopy study. But, I'm not going to talk much about alpha-synuclein, but that seems to be a major component of what is in Lewy bodies. And in the question and answer session, if you have more uh, interest in learning about alpha-synuclein and Lewy bodies, we can uh, go into that. But I'm not going to digress. Uh, but I thought it's helpful to know we've talked about dopamine, substantia nigra, stratum, and now Lewy bodies. These are sort of fundamental terms and concepts in the world of Parkinson's disease. Well. Heiko Brock, a neuroanatomist from Frankfurt, Germany, back in 2003, wrote what I, what I conclude is one of the most important papers in the world of Parkinson's disease. Nobody really looks at the data in terms of the, the overall global thing that's going on here. Well, Heiko Brock did that, and he recognized that if you see the spectrum of Lewy body disease, there's actually a broad spectrum that starts out very early in life before you get the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And in fact, he says that once you get the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the movement problems, the slowness of movement, the stiffness, uh, tremor most of the time, the majority of them come down with a Lewy body process most of the time, Parkinson's disease. So this is presumably an early forerunner of Parkinson's disease. Where is the nucleus located, the brain region that is the substrate for REM sleep behavior disorder, the area that degenerates to uh, uh, unmask your dream behavior? Well, it's probably about in this region of the brain, the brain stem. And, and this arrow here, it was, this is from Brock's paper, 2003. And basically what he says is that these early signs represent the early stages of Parkinson's disease that do not involve the substantia nigra, which is at this level, I'm pointing to the midbrain, but they start in the brain stem, the olfactory bulb, and you can see here olfactory loss, loss of sense of smell, can be a, early, a very early sign of Parkinson's disease. Anxiety and depression, unclear where that's centered. This autonomia, that's constipation as an early sign. People that have constipation in midlife are at an increased risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Now, obviously, constipation is common, and that doesn't mean if you're constipated. So if you have, if you are constipated in midlife and are otherwise normal, that's not a slam dunk. You're going to be, come down with Parkinson's disease, but statistically, you are at a significantly greater risk of later coming down with Parkinson's disease 
And that's the autonomic nervous system. It says dysautonomia up there. That means your autonomic nervous system is malfunctioning. That's the internal nervous system that's in the periphery that regulates bowels, bladder, blood pressure, and sweating. And that also is a component of Parkinson's disease malfunction. So the things that occur early before you get the, the obvious problems of Parkinson's disease are things in the lower brainstem, and we, we already talked about REM sleep behavior disorder, things in the autonomic nervous system, which would be in the body itself, the nervous system in the gut, the olfactory bulb, which I'm pointing to right here, so that's, that's relevant to people that lose their sense of smell. Sometimes that occurs concurrent with Parkinson's disease as these symptoms do, but sometimes it precedes them by many years. How long? Well, in our Olmsted County, Minnesota population, constipation as well as REM sleep behavior disorder have been recorded in people 20 plus years before they came down with the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But if you're a practical physician, if you have Parkinson's disease, you have to know there are other systems involved, but for the things that are really pretty important for the average person with Parkinson's disease, dopamine replenishment, that neurotransmitter dopamine, is absolutely crucial. Let's slightly digress for a minute and talk about progression. So progression obviously occurs. Progression occurs in human beings in general. You know, I'm not as facile in a lot of things as I was 25 years ago. I hung up my, my driveway basketball shoes back about age 55, you know? And so there are a lot of things that wear out in the human body. Well, Parkinson's disease sort of goes the same way. It's a different trajectory than aging, but Every decade of life, as you get older, stuff happens. And in Parkinson's disease, things happen somewhat predictably. So we've already talked about that a little bit, but I didn't talk about things that, that occur later on. And these are things that if, if I'm going to be organizing research endeavors for finding the cure for Parkinson's disease, I'm not going to focus on dopamine. We have some pretty decent strategies for replenishing dopamine, and if that doesn't work, then brain surgery, deep brain stimulation for making up the difference. Not perfect, but pretty good. But the things that I would focus on for finding the cure would be finding the cause, and the cause is this Lewy body process that then ascends. You can see Heiko Brock's drawing up there. The arrow doesn't end uh, at the midbrain. The arrow goes all the way up to the cortex increased risk of becoming demented. So cognitive impairment has nothing to do with dopamine. This is an entirely different set of neurons and neurotransmitters. But this is a big deal for me. If I have Parkinson's disease, I would like to identify something that would prevent the progression from going that far. Over time, if you have Parkinson's disease long enough and you get old enough, the motor symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease don't respond as completely. Folks in my clinic who are, let's say, 50, 60, early 70s, I tell them that I'm expecting you, who has Parkinson's disease, to get within 20 to 30 percent of normal with dopamine replenishment therapy, which is what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. If you're over the age of 80, I'm not so sure I can get you to 50 percent. but. What's that residual 20% or 50% levodopa refractory symptoms, non-dopamine replenishment responsive symptoms that relate to this Lewy body neurodegenerative process that extends outside of the dopamine circuitry? So this concept of Lewy body neurodegeneration is very relevant to where we need to go with research. We've got to figure out a way to stop this, and if, if if we're going to find a strategy for stopping it, probably need to know what the mechanisms are that cause Parkinson's disease in the first place. And then I also mentioned autonomic symptoms. Those are pretty treatable, but they don't have a dopamine base. So that's constipation and urinary symptoms, you know, can't control your urination and so on. Well, do we have any drugs that slow the progression of Parkinson's disease? I get asked that question pretty much by, well, at least 50% of the people that I see in the clinic. So I put together this table here that enrolled at least 100 patients, and sometimes many more than that, that looked at drugs that some smart scientists thought 
may affect the, the may get at the cause of Parkinson's disease. And there's a whole host of different drugs here that are not at all related one to the other. And it turns out they were all failures. 11 drugs, 11 major clinical trials, each costing you know, more, well more than a million dollars and uh, with large numbers of patients, and they really didn't translate into anything meaningful. Well, these were helpful because if you know what doesn't work, I mean, you're sort of 10% of the way there. I think we're also learning that just, uh, you know, throwing darts blindfolded at a dartboard probably isn't really a productive strategy. You need to know a little bit more about what is causing Parkinson's disease. So, I mean, that's helpful to do these studies, and that's becoming recognizable as well, too. Now, having given this talk before, there's always someone in the audience that says, well, what about Azelect, Resagiline? So I put that on here. So Resagiline is the Adagio study which is right here, and there is a tempo study before that. All these studies have these acronyms, you know, so everything in the world of medicine is consensus panels and committees that do things like name things, you know. So the Adagio trial related to resagiline, which is Azelect, and the initial interest was that this might be a drug that slows the progression of Parkinson's disease, and Teva Pharmaceuticals petitioned the Food and Drug Administration to allow them to advertise this as slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease, and that was the reason they did the Odagio study. That was sort of a study that, if you read it, your head started to spin halfway through, and by the time you got done, you know, you're ready to go to sleep. This is so complex and so confounded, and I would say almost uninterpretable in terms of the outcomes. And uh, so, with that study, the Teva Pharmaceuticals took their data to the USA Food and Drug Administration, and this is, this is like the, I think it's a health council in Canada where they, they can approve drugs for specific purposes. So it had already been approved as symptomatic treatment for Parkinson's disease. It's mildly beneficial for treating symptoms. It's not fabulous. But they, they wanted the ability to advertise this as slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease. If they could, if they could say that, this is a billion-dollar drug, you know, this is one of, the, one of those blockbuster drugs. So the Food and Drug Administration, as they always do, they, they uh, convene a uh, panel of experts, relative experts in different areas, to listen to the argument from Teva Pharmaceuticals. And after all the discussion was done, this group voted 17 to 0 against approving Azelec for slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease. Well, I never had the faith in the first place, but if I tell you that, then you probably are going to say, well, what does he know? But at least the FDA had 17 people that, that agreed with that viewpoint. Well, I said we don't have any drugs that are, that are proven to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, but we have one thing, and you already heard from Colin about exercise. Now, in the U.S., you know, we've, we've become, you know, the people in this room, they're, everybody looks like they're in pretty good shape here. If I give this talk to a group of folks who are middle-aged on up in the upper Midwest, people don't always look like they're in fabulous shape. So you can see here that we've become a society that watches too much TV, we're on our iPads and our computers and our iPhones, and we're playing video games and sending text messages, and we're online Googling things. Well, that's all fine and good, but if you do that to the exclusion of, you know, just being active, then that isn't so good for your body. So people don't intuitively, you wouldn't, come up with a conclusion that exercise would slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. If you get maybe a couple hundred people and a hundred are in the exercise group and the other hundred are randomly assigned to the other group, so it's a randomization process. Now the exercise group, just knowing how humans are, they're not going to be too inclined to exercise. If, if That may be different in British Columbia, but I can tell you in Minnesota, you know, this is going to last about two weeks and then people are going to go back to old habits again. On the other hand, the the control group, the group is randomized to something like just stretching and toning and so on, they're going to be thinking, you know, there's a reason they're doing this study. I think exercise is probably good, so I think I'm going to do that. So this is the kind of problem you'd run into. And then the outcome, too, you have to have an outcome that can't be modified by the medications you use to treat Parkinson's disease, because those medications produce visible outcomes that are beneficial. 
and it's hard to control for that. And you can't tell people you can't be on any of these medications. No, who, would, who would be silly enough to volunteer for that kind of a study? So you can see this study can't be done. So I'm going to argue indirectly that vigorous exercise, aerobic exercise, there is good evidence that that may slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, that it has a direct effect. Now, I don't think any medical doctor would argue that the second point here, it reduces hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis. And brain aging is uh, heavily influenced by small vessel especially, but also large vessel hardening of the arteries. And nobody would argue that exercise helps uh, reverse, helps r limit the manifestations of hardening of the arteries, which is atherosclerosis. Animal studies, we've got two slides on animal studies. The animals are rats or mice. And, and, doing, and an, doing a study with rats or mice allows you to do a couple of things. Number one is you can chop off their heads and measure brain chemicals. <laughs> all right, so you can see why we're limiting it to rats and mice. Second of all, if you've ever had hamsters or mice, your kids have had them, you know if you put a running wheel in the cage, you can also use treadmills too. You can put a rat on a treadmill and the treadmill's going and the rat pretty quickly realizes you gotta keep going or you're gonna fall off into the pool of water at the bottom. So there are different ways of, of doing these studies, but it's a very reliable way to exercise animals. And then at the end of that study, after a few months, then you can measure things directly in the brain. Well, what's been measured? These are, this is not intended to be introductory biochemistry, but these are things that if you just think about the name, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, GDNF, glial-derived neurotrophic factor. Glials are the, uh, the supporting cells uh, within the brain. Neurotrophic factors in this context are like putting fertilizer on your lawn. So if you have some nitrogen-based fertilizer, you're going to have this tall grass that your, your son or daughter is going to have to cut three times a week if you put enough on there. Well, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF and GDNF, are just like that in your brain. And in fact, it was, oh, about 10 years ago that there were a number of studies done in the U.S. where they put volunteered Parkinson's patients got cannulas in their brain and they infused GDNF, thinking that this is going to be good for Parkinson's disease. And there were mixed results from that, but you can see that theoretically this makes a lot of sense. And exercise liberates these, increases the concentrations of BDNF and GDNF in the brain. And beyond that, it also increases the activity of neuroplasticity-related genes. Neuroplasticity relates to that ongoing creation of new connections in the brain. So I mentioned remembering my hotel room number. Well, I didn't have to spend a lot of time studying it. I mean, I looked at it, and then the next day I re remember it. Yeah, it's room 1003, you know. Why is that? Well, neuroplasticity. Because when I saw that, and then I concentrated for a couple of seconds, that plastic process in the brain allowed that connection to be made. And I can see it in my mind's eye right now. 1003, right in the room door. Which happens to us all the time. That we, when we remember things, it's because of neuroplasticity. We've created or reinforced a connection. Remembering what you did yesterday, uh, when your kids came to visit, uh, what you had for breakfast. These are all things that you remember because of neuroplasticity. These are connections that are made and reinforced by just the, the act of doing them. So neuroplasticity is also involved with learning athletic skills, hitting a golf ball, hitting a tennis ball, hitting a baseball. If you practice those things, they get better. That's because of these plastic kinds of activities within the brain that allows you to groove your golf swing. So neuroplasticity-related uh, genes get activated, the proteins that are the products of that gene work, those get activated as well. So that's basically a primer in these studies on what happens when you exercise animals. And I put the references up there. So more, more animal studies relating to exercise. And again, this is now we're away from the biochemistry, but animals that exercised have hippocampal neurogenesis increased. In the uh, hippocampus, which is a memory center, it's one of the 
very, very few areas of the brain where you can make new cells. So neurogenesis basically means new neurons, and that's enhanced in animals that exercise within the hippocampus, which is a memory center. And the dendrites are on the receiving end of the synapse, which is that space between that terminal that releases the dopamine and then receptor that receives it. Those dendrites become more luxurious in their outgrowth. They form more complexity, and that also occurs in animals that are exercised, indicative of this neuroplastic process. All right, well, let's talk about humans. So humans in exercise. So the studies, there are, quite, there are actually a lot of studies in humans, but I'm just going to show you a few, and then we're going to move on to something that's, that's even more practical. This slide shows you everything in the brain. And so those hippocampi, if you, if you had some process, such as two strokes, one on each side, which would very rarely happen, something that bad a coincidence, but you have memory. That's where memory is located, especially in the hippocampus and this whole temporal lobe. So if you lost both temporal lobes, uh, you'd have a conversation and wouldn't even remember 30 seconds later you'd had a conversation. All right, so we're going to look at hippocampal volumes in human beings as measured by MRI scans. So if a neuroradiologist uh, is asked to measure the volume of the hippocampus, they can do that if they're sufficiently sophisticated and have the right software. So they can measure the area on a given slice and they can summate that area to get a three-dimensional volume. Well, it turns out that if you're physically fit, which takes, you know, years, months at least, of, of exercise, that people that are fit have larger hippocampi. And so people that have a high uptake, they're the most fit. People that have a poor uptake, they're the least fit. And on this axis here, high numbers are large hippocampi and small numbers are small hippocampi. And you can see that the more fit you are, the larger is your hippocampus. But what they did was they took groups of middle-aged people who didn't have any neurologic problem, and that was true for the slide I just showed you. These were basically normal folks, neurologically normal. This is a group of normal folks who were randomized to either exercise or no exercise. They didn't have Parkinson's disease, but they measured at baseline six months and one year. So right hippocampus, left hippocampus. And interesting, this is, this is sort of not entirely intuitive, but after six months of exercise, these curves are starting to diverge now. So the exercise group has a slightly larger hippocampus, and the non-exercise group has a smaller hippocampus, and that trend continues out to one year. Now, these aren't huge changes in the hippocampal volume. So the hippocampus doesn't become some huge mass on each side. But these are things that are measurable, and these are statistically significant findings. And so that shows you that exercise can translate into structural changes in the brain in the areas where you want those changes to occur. And this is the last slide of this topic I'm going to show you. It turns out that in all of these, the group that was the poorest fit, they were measured at time zero. The fitness wasn't measured again, but the poorest fit of these had the most unfavorable trajectory. In other words, as you get older and older, you don't do quite so well on these IQ-like tests. And if you're unfit, you did you had an unfavorable fit. And this is the dotted line, and the dotted line here. These two curves, the graph goes in the other direction, but in all four of those, the more fit you were at baseline, the more favorable was the change in your capacity to perform well on those IQ tests. All right, so bottom line is, is that I, I can argue, and if, if you asked me to provide references, I'd come up with about 150 references from the entire literature on Parkinson's disease and cognition. You can do a, not a Google search, but a NIH search, that's the National Institute of Health in the U.S., and you can put in Parkinson's disease and cognition, you can put in Parkinson's disease, uh, rather Parkinson's disease and exercise, cognition and exercise, and if you read all of those papers and then you provided a reference list with all the relevant studies, that would number over 150 references. How would I know that? Because I read them. It's, we have long winters in Minnesota. 
That's what I tell the residents. You know, this is a real advantage coming here. They're looking at maybe University of Miami and so on. No, 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 no. You won't write any papers if you go there. So you want to you want to come to beautiful Rochester, Minnesota. All right. So now we're going to talk about symptomatic treatment of Parkinson's disease. And obviously, this is a very practical issue because I would contend that we do pretty well for the most part treating Parkinson's disease. What are the goals? I mean, it's important if you're a physician to know what you're trying to accomplish and what you're not trying to accomplish. So one of the things is you don't need to treat people if you're doing fine. If you have a little bit of a rest tremor and you don't swing your arm and that's the whole extent of Parkinson's disease, I'm not gonna treat that person. Now, if the tremor is really bad and they're an attorney or a public speaker or a minister and the tremor is intrusive, you know, then I would treat that. But if it doesn't bother them, I'm certainly not going to treat them. But if daily living, their social life, they're becoming a couch potato or a recluse, they're not going out anymore. Clearly, that's somebody that I don't want that. I want to maximize people. You know, our lives are pretty short. You know, we're all going to die someday, and you, you don't want to have people spending a fraction of their life, you know, confined to, you know, being housebound. So I want people to be as close to normal as I can get them. So who would argue with that? But second of all, I want them to engage in exercise. And so that's what, what is the kind of exercise I want them to engage in? Well, go for brisk walks, uh, play racquetball, uh, play tennis, uh, go to the gym, engage in Becky Farley's power training. That's all great stuff. But it's aerobic exercise. What is that? It's anything that makes you hot, sweaty, and tired. It isn't a sweat per se. If you go in a sauna or a steam room, that doesn't help you. But if you go out in the backyard and dig a hole and get sweaty, that's aerobic exercise. So things that would tend to make you fit if you did those over a more prolonged period of time. How much do you have to do? I don't know. Nobody knows that. The American Heart Association says 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise and, 70, and 50 minutes a week of uh, weight training, 30 minutes a week of weight training. And uh, if you engage in very vigorous exercise, like running and so on, then it's 75 minutes a week. Myself, I don't, you know, that's sort of a conservative uh, recommendation. Uh, I tell people, try to do an hour every other day or an hour four times a week. And, and, and it should be a good hour. It's not just, it's, this is not exercise. And kneeling down and, and digging up bulbs from your garden, that's, you know, that's great, but that isn't really aerobic exercise either. So anything that makes you hot, sweaty, and tired. All right, so now we're going to talk about medications for Parkinson's disease, so basic principles. And this is basic principles in my clinic. So this is stuff that patients have taught me over about 35 years. So I know if you're a physician, and I have the good fortune to work at the Mayo Clinic where I am allocated enough time to talk to people and listen to people. And that's huge, you know, in this day and age. Everything is about moving faster, you know. And we're going to have people do questionnaires and do things online so you don't have to talk to them very long. Boy, this is misguided, I think. This is not the way that you can handle the complexity of human medicine and human behavior. So I have the good fortune to have adequate time, most of the time, to listen to people and have them tell me what works and what doesn't work. So what I've concluded, this is actually long ago, but it's been reinforced day in and day out, is that the most efficacious drug by far for treating Parkinson's disease is carbidopa levodopa. The active ingredient is levodopa. That is the precursor to dopamine. We don't give dopamine because dopamine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. There's a natural barrier that protects the brain from all kinds of chemical constituents in our bloodstream, you know, things that are liberated after a meal, things that you don't want to go into your brain because they would make you psychotic or otherwise uh, worse things. And so this blood-brain barrier has an important physiologic purpose, but it doesn't allow dopamine to get into the brain if you swallow it or infuse it into a vein. Levodopa is transported into the brain. There's a natural transporter, a biologic molecule that picks up large neutral amino acids and carries those into the brain. Amino acids, levodopa is an amino acid. That's the class of biologic molecules from uh, which it's contained. You all have levodopa in your, in your body and you have amino acids in all the proteins in your body. All right, people are gonna ask, well, what about the synthetic forms of dopamine? I've listed them here. Premipexol, which is Mirapex, Rapinrol, which is Requip, Nupro Patch, which is Reticotine, 
I've heard some experts say that, well, these are almost as good as levodopa. And I would argue they're not even close. I see a lot of patients that come to see me, they're not doing well, and they're only on one of those three drugs, and they're walking into the room barely. They've got a walker, or they, they can't get started. Their feet are stuck to the floor. And uh, six weeks later, when they're transitioned to carbidopa, levodopa, then they walk in, and they tell me how smart I am. Boy, you're the greatest doctor in the world. Well, it's pretty reinforcing, to be honest with you. If enough people tell you that, you realize, geez, I think I've hit on something. Because <laughs> I'm not a genius, but when people tell you something works, then, then that's, that's pretty reinforcing. Levodopa is also can be combined with this stuff called enticapone that has a biologic purpose here. It prolongs the lifespan of levodopa in the bloodstream, but not for real long, 30 to 60 minutes, and it's expensive, and I don't think that's necessary. So that's not in, in my list of drugs that I use. So carbidopa levodopa is what you have to get right. Well, we should talk about dopamine agonists for a minute because there's another reason that I'm less and less and less and less inclined to prescribe those, and it has to do with side effects. And some of these are not intuitively obvious. So we're talking about primarily Mirapex and Requip. Nupro is this patch, and it's sort of the, one of the newer drugs, and the patch comes in sizes that don't make it very therapeutic. You know, you can most... The largest patch size is eight milligrams, and that's just starting to tap into the benefits. So Requip and Mirapex can cause pathological behaviors. And this we saw back uh, 10 years ago in the clinic. There's several of us that, as we're talking in the hallway, colleagues of mine saying, geez, I just had another patient that became a pathological gambler, lost $10,000, never gambled before. Well, to make a long story short, that's Mirapex or Requip. These drugs almost counterintuitively can provoke behaviors that are inherently rewarding but done to excess. So that would be gambling, hypersexuality primarily but not exclusively in men, spending on things that really are not wise or necessary. Anything that's rewarding can be reinforced by those drugs. And our experience was you can't lower the dose and expect that to go away. You have to get people off of those medications let a few weeks or months elapse most of the time, and then you revert back to baseline. These drugs have an interesting pharmacology. They bind to a specific dopamine receptor. There are five dopamine receptors in the brain. This binds to one of them, the dopamine D3 receptor, these two drugs, Mirapex and, and Requip. And the D3 receptor is located in the limbic system. In fact, when they wrote the original paper, when the D3 receptor was closed, cloned, the the molecular biology team knew where these D3 receptors are located and they put in the abstract. These are largely confined to the limbic system in the brain, the dopamine limbic system. What is a limbic system, you might ask? That's the hedonistic system in the brain. That's the reward system. So things that are inherently rewarding in about one person in four on therapeutic doses of Recoup or Mirapex will develop one of these behaviors. How do I know it's one in four? Well, we looked at that among the five of us in our movement disorders clinic who are now warning people about this uh, when they came to see us. So we, now we were, we were reliably asking everybody, do you have any of these behaviors? It turned out that people who were on one of these two drugs, one in four had one of these behaviors. And pathological is the operative term here. It isn't just that now you're going to the casino and you're losing $50. These are people with big time gambling problems or men who are doing things that you don't want them to do. Drowsiness, about one person in, I don't know, 10 or 12, becomes pathologically brow drowsy with one of these drugs. And the first paper written on this was out of Columbia University, Stephen Frook in 1999. Nine people who got into car accidents because they had sleep attacks. So important to know. And then finally, swelling. There's an occasional person, I don't see this very often, who has this massive swelling in their legs and they're on multiple water pills and their legs are being wrapped and nobody can figure out, and they don't have organ failure like heart disease or lung disease, and yet they have this massive swelling. Turns out that when I see those people, I look at the medicine list and if it's Mirapex or Requip, we get them off that and then that, that becomes a non-problem after that. So how do I start carbidopa levodopa? Well, this is, this is my strategy, and 
perhaps not everybody agrees precisely with this, but this is a strategy of my colleagues down the hall, too, in Mayo, Rochester. So I use the, now this strategy works if it's the 25100 regular carbidopa levodopa. Sometimes that's called immediate release. It's not like a quick release. It's just that it's a regular pill, and that's to be distinguished from sustained release. Sustained release is also controlled release. So cinnamon CR really is a fun, it's the same active ingredients, but it's formulated in a way that is, doesn't correspond to this. So for this to work, it has to be these pills. Now I've got in there yellow. Is yellow important? Well, I don't care if they're yellow or purple, but the fact of the matter is if they're yellow, then you know you're getting this kind of a pill. At least in the U.S., all the 25100 regular carbidopa levodopa pills are yellow. So sometimes people don't know what they're taking, and I'll say, what color is your pill? And when I ask them that, if they say, yes, it's yellow, then I, I know what they're taking. So I tell them, I need to take it on an empty stomach. Is that important? Yep, that's really important. And I start out with one tablet three times a day, but I tell them that one tablet three times a day is usually too low to do much good, but we have to start low. And then we build up. Every week they add a half tablet to all three doses, and most people find the best effect by the time they've gone through this whole scheme. Now they might realize they were doing as well on one and a half as two and a half, and you can always go backwards in the scheme, but I have them go up from one to one and a half, two to two and a half, and then I see them back in about six weeks, and, and if they're doing better, which they should if they have Parkinson's disease, then we settle on the dose that works the best. Now, if three doses all work, the same common sense dictates why take the highest if you do as well in a lower dose. So it's no more complicated than that. I don't have people go higher than three tablets at a time because I have not seen anybody who's convinced me they do better on four tablets at a time or five. So it's really between one and three tablets each dose. Here's something you read online. Save levodopa for later. You may, you may want it when you're 60 years old or whatever. You can't save this. There's no evidence you can save these responses by taking it later. And I think just the opposite. If you withhold it, then in the long run you don't do as well. You become a couch potato, you slow down, you reduce your activities, and it's very, it's very hard to restore activities once you've uh, been sort of in a sedentary mode uh, over more than a few weeks. So there's no evidence you can save the best responses. You don't need to start carbidopa levodopa just because you have a tremor, but if you're starting to scale back activities and things aren't going very well, then I personally want you as good as you can be, and that's going to be time to start the carbidopa levodopa. So I mentioned Got to take it on an empty stomach. Why is that? I also mentioned that levodopa is an amino acid. It gets into the brain because of that transporter at the blood-brain barrier, this biologic molecule that picks up amino acids and transports those into the brain. Well, this is like the, the, uh, the plane we took yesterday, the, the plane that lands in the water, only like nine or 10 seats. We almost couldn't get seats on there. Well, this is a little bit like that transporter. If you fill up all the seats on the train with dietary amino acids, there aren't any seats left for levodopa. Dietary amino acids, what, what are we talking about here? Proteins are strings of amino acids. So it's a glass of milk, cottage cheese, fish, meat, cheese. Those are proteins. When you digest them, the digestive system cuts them up into the constituent amino acids. They take up all the seats on the train. That's the problem. So you, you can't get levodopa on board. Is this uh, important in real life? Yeah, there are people that have very, they're very sensitive to levodopa, either it works or it doesn't, and they will tell you that if I take it on an empty stomach, it always kicks in. If you take it with a meal, it never kicks in. And that, that isn't so obvious early on in Parkinson's disease, but I can tell you that if you're not doing well and you're taking your carbidopa levodopa with meals, that's probably the reason you're not doing very well. So it needs to be at least an hour before meals and at least two hours after the end of meals. This is something that isn't recognized either. Many Parkinson's symptoms respond all or none. Intuitively, you would think there would be a graded response, but there isn't. A little dose does nothing. 
a little more of levodopa does nothing, a little more does nothing, a little more, boom. Now I'm over a threshold, and now things fall into place. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes with regard to anxiety and sleep. And there's nothing more obvious to me about this all or none response than with those two Parkinsonian symptoms. Number five, levodopa dose response patterns change after a few years. This is that wearing off effect now that comes on after a few years. So the first few years of Parkinson's disease, there is a long duration response. And that's a response that no matter when you took your three doses, you could take them all in the morning. If you take them too close together, the effects double up. So you want to have them spaced a few hours apart, but you could take them you know, every three hours, every six hours, every eight hours, we took all of them bedtime and during the night. As long as you got all three doses in per 24 hours, you'll have the same nice stable response. By the same token, if you're on a stable dose and you realize, boy, I'm really doing a lot better, if you stopped it, if you have a long duration response, you might be pretty good. One day, two days, three days, but then about a week later, the wheels fall off the wagon. That's the long duration response. And that's something that's present the first few years of Parkinson's disease. Not necessarily the first few years of treatment, the first few years of Parkinson's disease. So if for some reason you were on a desert island and didn't have any levodopa available for seven years, let's say, then when you started it, when you got back off the island, you might have these sh this transition to the short duration responses within the first six months or so. Short duration responses relate to this wearing off that you probably have heard about. So these people, the classic case, and this is the typical story, they, they might say, you know, in the morning I wake up, haven't had any levodopa overnight, take my first dose, takes an hour to kick in, and then I'm pretty good for about four hours, and then the effect wears off. So that's where the term wearing off comes in. So that's the short duration response. The response gets tied to each dose. So here's the schematic that illustrates that, and you probably have already figured this out, but now these are just cartoons, so these aren't actual measurements, but the upper graph depicts what should be going on in the brain with brain L-dopa levels. So you take a dose right here, and the L-dopa level rises, and it kind of plateaus and drops off, and the response, which is Parkinsonian signs, behave time-locked to that response. So you take a dose, the effect lasts a while, and then it wears off. What do you do about that? Well, the typical person, you know, I might, this might be somebody that I initially started levodopa, they were doing well, let's say for, oh, three to eight years, and then they come back and, and they'll say, boy, this is terrible, I've got tremor, and I can't walk very well, my feet are stuck to the floor, and then sometimes I'll realize, geez, you just walked in here, you look pretty good today, I'm not seeing any tremor and you're walking okay. Well, I should have seen me yesterday or an hour ago or something like that. That's a tip off for doctors that good some of the time, not good the rest of the time. And patients have selective memories. What they tell their doctor is, I'm doing terribly. And sometimes you have to have this sort of physician's intuition that maybe, you know, it's been a few years since you've had Parkinson's disease onset. Maybe you've got a wearing off response. And the problem isn't that you need more levodopa, which you, in my clinic is virtually almost never the case but it's that the effect is wearing off, so you need to take the doses closer together. So here's, here's the strategy. You need to choose the dose that works the best and then use that at intervals that match the response duration. Now, why did I put that up there, the dose that works the best? Because online, this is stuff that you might go online and read about Parkinson's disease. I've seen this more than a few times. They say, if you're gonna use levodopa more often, take lower doses dead wrong because of the threshold effect. You know, that little does nothing, little does nothing, little more does nothing, little more, boom, now you're over the threshold and things fall into place. So the dose that, that I've identified in the clinic early on, two tablets each dose, two and a half each dose, originally three times a day. Now if people come back and I figure out they only have a four hour response, I'm gonna use that same dose. If it's two and a half, that's the dose because I want the dose that works the best. If we'd lower the dose, now they'd be below threshold. Now they'd be bad all day long. So you want the dose that works the best, and then you have to figure out how long does the effect last. And the idea is that as one dose is wearing off, the next one's kicking in. So if you time it just right, then you're kind of maintaining a stable level of 
levodopa and dopamine in the brain, which is the whole strategy. I used this slide uh, the previous two lectures in Victoria and Abbotsford, and, and questions led me to increase the size of these, the font here. Don't worry about the number of doses or tablets per day. And sometimes authorities worry about it. Well, you're taking more than eight tablets a day. You know, you better not do that. I've gotten faxes from pharmacy plans that say, did you know your patient is taking more than eight tablets a day? And you know, I don't know how you respond to that. So I write a note there, I know that. Higher doses don't last longer. So if, if you, two and a half tablets last four hours, four tablets is gonna last four hours and 15 minutes. So all you do if you raise the size of the doses is you use a tendency to make people a little bit overdosed, which is dyskinesias, which we're gonna talk about uh, shortly. So find the dose that works the best, and then you take it at intervals that match the response duration. Dyskinesias, so more stuff you hear online that isn't true. Dyskinesias are worse than Parkinson's disease. That's the last thing you ever want is dyskinesias. That's a lot of baloney. Dyskinesias represent too much of a levodopa effect at that moment in time. They do not relate to the total daily dose of levodopa. They relate to the dose you just took. So Michael J. Fox, when you see him sometimes, he's wiggly like this. Those are dyskinesias. dyskinesias are visible wiggliness, is visible wiggliness. Sometimes it's just an arm that might be doing this or just a foot that's doing something like that. In Michael J. Fox's case, he tends sometimes to be like this. That's from too good a levodopa effect. So if you think about levodopa and dopamine, if you have too little dopamine, you move slowly. If you have just the right amount of dopamine, you move normally. If you have too much dopamine, you move too much. Things that are not dyskinesias that, that need less levodopa is dystonia, toes cramping, cramping of your calf muscles, foot turning in. That means you've got too little levodopa at that moment in time. Dyskinesias are dancing movements, flowing movements. Dystonia is a contracted state. And if anything, that requires more levodopa. Some kinds of dystonias are hard to treat, but they, not, they very, very rarely, a pure dystonia is, that is uh, related to the too much levodopa. The other thing that sometimes gets mixed up with dyskinesia is a couple of things. One would be tremor. Tremor is a rhythmic movement. Tremor is a sine wave. What I'm imitating here are chaotic movements. So they're not rhythmic, there's no pattern. And then the other thing that's mixed up with dyskinesias would be the doctor's term is akathisia. That's an inner restlessness. I feel like I need to move. But when you see people with akathisia, they're usually sitting and they're kind of like this. They're not moving very much unless they have a tremor, which is a to and fro movement. So feeling like you need to move but not moving means you need more levodopa. Moving too much but feeling pretty good, that's dyskinesias. You can always get rid of dyskinesias by reduce each dose. It's not the total daily dose, it's the dose you just took. So if, you over, if the dose you just took is a little bit excessive, then when it kicks in in an hour, then you'll be moving too much, and then when it wears off, then it's a new game again. Then the next dose needs to be less, and I can guarantee you, you can always get rid of dyskinesias. Now the trouble for people like Michael J. Fox is probably that he has a very narrow window between overdosed and underdosed. So if he lowers his levodopa, I don't, he's not my patient, so I, I have no direct knowledge, but I'm just inferring this. Probably if he lowered his levodopa dose, he'd be underdosed, and then he would be, he would be no good as an actor. So you probably, has elected to err on the side of being a little bit overdosed. Dyskinesias sometimes are not recognized by people that have those. I, I mean, one, you know, I've had all kinds of people teach me things in the clinic, but when I figured that out, there's this guy sitting on the couch and I'm looking at him and, and he's like this, and I'm not exaggerating. So I try to tactfully ask him, well, do you ever have any extra movements? Nope, never have them. <laughs> and I realized, yeah. A lot of people are totally oblivious to that. And a lot of times, uh, it would be the spouse, you know, or the partner or family, the kids that mention that. Yeah, dad's moving a lot, yeah. But sometimes you can, you know, a lot of times you can just see that as well, too. 
And then you have to determine as a physician is it, you know how bad is it if it's if this is a rare kind of thing I don't make major changes just at the drop of a hat but if it's sort of ongoing you can always get rid of those and that's pretty easy to do the question is if you lower the dose are they going to be now underdosed and then then they have to make a decision underdosed or overdosed but another interesting thing you know about these admonitions worst thing that can happen is to get dyskinesias. Well, it turns out if you get Parkinson's disease at the usual age, not like Michael J. Fox, who probably got it about age 30, these young people who get it before 40, which are extremely rare, I might add, they are at a very high risk for dyskinesias after five years of levodopa. The Queen Square Group in London estimated about 95% of young onset, onset before age 40, will have dyskinesias after five years of levodopa. So they're, they're manageable, but they're hard to manage. However, over age 70, after five years of levodopa, the aggregate risk, 70s and 80s up to 90, 16% of people get dyskinesias after five years of levodopa treatment. And a sort of intermediate there is 60 to 70, a quarter of people get dyskinesias. Now, this doesn't mean they're terrible. This just means that they're documented in the medical record. And if those are people in the clinic, then I'm going to lower the dose. And uh, after 10 years of levodopa, that was another study, I'm not showing you the slide, but only 12% of people had dyskinesias that could not be controlled with medication adjustments. In other words, you either underdosed or overdosed. And guess what you do for that? That's DBS time, deep brain stimulation, which is, which is a very good treatment for that. Number seven. Anxiety, akathisia, which we just heard about, heard about, and panic, are common in Parkinson's disease and respond to levodopa. This often goes unrecognized. Now, some people uh, have been anxious all their lives. Levodopa is not going to help them. But since you got Parkinson's disease, if you realize that, boy, I just have this terrible anxiety, I don't know where this came from, typically that's going to be responsive to levodopa. And that all or none issue that I mentioned a little earlier directly applies to anxiety. And if people take a little bit of levodopa or a half dose, it doesn't kick in, they're below threshold, and the anxiety is still there. So they have to have a levodopa on response. And in my experience, anxiety due to Parkinson's disease responds very well to levodopa. And I think it's Probably in my clinic, it's the most common non-motor symptom of Parkinson's disease. And sometimes it reaches huge proportions, you know, where we, we had to bring grandma into the emergency room. She was fit to be tied. And that's a problem sometimes because, you know, you, you, people get started on medicines that are from the Valium class. And that's usually not a good thing to give people, especially if they're seniors. It makes them a little sedated and clumsy and a fall risk, and besides being a little bit addicting as well, too. So there are two reasons you might have one of these symptoms. Either you've got a wearing off problem, you know, people are pretty good, pretty good for a few hours, and it wears off, then they get anxious. Or if they're anxious across the board in the context of Parkinson's disease, it might be that their doses of levodopa are below threshold. Or maybe they're not even on levodopa. Maybe they're only on Mirapex, for example, or Requip, the dopamine agonist. So then you need to start them on levodopa, and you have to get the doses above threshold. And typically, this turns out to be very responsive. And then the, the last uh, slide about uh, relating to all these different symptoms relates to sleep. So. A lot of middle-aged people who don't have Parkinson's disease have insomnia, can't get to sleep or wake up in the middle of the night. None of them are going to be helped by levodopa. But if you have Parkinson's disease and insomnia is something that started uh, after the onset of Parkinson's disease or concurrently with that, then levodopa turns out to be a godsend for most people. But again, that all or none response directive uh, is relevant here. You need to take an adequate dose. People sometimes intuit intuitively think that, uh, well, I'm, I'm asleep, so I'll just take a low dose. It doesn't work that way. It's that all or none response again. So if somebody comes to see me in the clinic, and let's say that I've been found for, for, for a few years, they're taking, let's say, two tablets out before breakfast, lunch, and supper, and then they say, well, my big problem now is I can't get to sleep. So I'll tell them, okay, take your full dose, which in their case would be two tablets, an hour before bedtime. Then they come back. Well, it's great, but now I wake up at four in the morning. What do you think I tell them then? 
Take another two tablets when you wake up. Now, it does take an hour to work, but that's a simple solution. So uh, it's not infrequent. I'll say, take your full dose, put it in the nightstand with a glass of water. When you wake up, you know, they go to the bathroom or whatever. Then if you take that, in an hour, they'll start to work again, and you can get back to sleep. Now, there is a role for controlled release, carbidopa, levodopa in that setting, but that's a little bit complicated, so I don't want to make your head spin. But if somebody's interested in that in the question and answer session, I'm happy to talk about that. And the last note in the slide here, cramps. Toe cramps are real common as an underdosed, wearing off kind of state, or cramps during the night. That means your levodopa effect typically has worn off. Great. <laughs>